All right, so last time we uh, introduced uh, states. So here we have a, a C star algebra. And let me remind you that we had uh, uh, A plus. This was the positive cone. And we had, uh, we introduced this uh, positive linear functional. So we have the, the dual and we say an element in the dual is uh, positive, so positive linear functional, if it takes positive things to positive non-negative numbers. So uh, if phi of x star x is greater than or equal to zero for all x and a. Um, so that was our definition of a positive linear functional. Actually, so I've written here the dual, which are continuous linear functionals, but uh, if you're just po if you satisfy this and you're linear, then you're automatically continuous. Uh, maybe that's uh, something we can show. Let's write this as a lemma, maybe. Uh, lemma: If uh, phi mapping a to the complex numbers is linear, and phi of x star x is greater than or equal to zero. So then, uh, phi is bounded. Uh, and if A has a unit, so then we have that the norm of phi is even dominated by phi at the value 1. Um, so we have an explicit bound of unit. Uh, so let's prove this lemma. This is a nice lemma. Uh, so here's the proof. So the thing to notice is let's suppose uh, suppose we have some sequence, say uh, x n. Rn A, so we have a whole sequence in A, and let's suppose that these are all positive, um, and then uh, and then we can suppose also, and let's suppose that they're uniformly bounded. So say x n all less than or equal to k, and suppose we have some sequence uh, A n. So this is a sequence of non-negative real numbers, but such that it's an L1. So this is an L1 sequence. Uh, well, then what do we know? We know that this is a uniformly bounded sequence, and this is an L1 sequence. So if we uh, multiply xn by an and then sum them up, we get a positive element in the C star algebra. And so we know, therefore, um, uh, yeah, so we know therefore that if we look at the sum a n phi of x n, well, by linearity, this is uh, the same as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of a n x. I'm going to apply phi to that. And now we have an element in our C star algebra A, so we know that this is uh, less than infinity, so it's some number. Uh, in particular, what does that say? That says that, therefore, this sequence here um, has to itself be in L infinity. So this n is in L infinity of the naturals. Right, because if it weren't in L infinity, then you can find an L1 sequence such that this was infinite. Uh, okay. Uh, so what does that mean? So that means that whenever we have any sequence, any bounded sequence of positive numbers, then, uh, then phi of this is also bounded. Yeah. Why 
Uh, oh, how, how can we, you're, you want to know how we can do this? Ah, okay, maybe that's a good question. Uh, so maybe you should say for finite sums. Uh, so this, uh, n equals, one, oh no, you're right, we just get less than or equal to. Uh, because this, for finite sums, So we can certainly do this for finite sums, but then recall here that that's a positive linear functional. You're right, we never used anywhere that is positive linear functional. So it's a positive linear functional, so if we add more to the finite sum, then we only get a larger number. Hmm? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have this, we can put this inside, and then this is less than or equal to uh, adding more things. Uh, okay, so this means that phi of xn gives us some L infinity thing. So at least we know if we restrict to uh, the bounded cone, then it's a bounded linear functional. Uh, but now by taking uh, real and imaginary parts and, and uh, positive and negative parts, you see it in general. Uh, so in general, if uh, x uh, n is in uh, the unit ball of A, so then we can write xn as uh, xn1 uh, plus minus xn2 plus i times xn3 minus xn4, where all the xn i's have norm less than or equal to the norm of xn, and the xn i's are positive. So therefore, we can see that uh, phi applied to this, of course, the absolute value of phi applied to this is going to be dominated by the sums of the absolute value, say. Uh, so it's going to be, therefore, bounded. Uh, so that shows that any positive linear functional is bounded. Uh, how do we get this extra condition when its norm, and that's from the general fact that if phi is a positive linear functional, so then the absolute value of phi of y star x is less than or equal to phi of y star y square root uh, phi of x star x square root. Uh, is this what I want to use here? I definitely want to mark, remark this fact. Uh, let's see, do I want to use this here? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay. So why is this the case? Uh, this is just Cauchy-Schwartz, right? Because we know that this association gives a non-negative definite uh, inner product on A. And so therefore, by Cauchy-Schwartz, we have this. Right? So this is Cauchy-Schwartz. So this is a very useful fact to keep in mind for positive linear functionals. Uh, in particular, if A has a unit, so therefore we have that the absolute value of phi of x is less than or equal, well we write this as 1 times x, so this is less than or equal to phi of 1, 1 half, and now we have square root and phi of x star x, square root. But now this is less than or equal to phi of 1 square root. And now we can just use the norm estimate here. So we get the norm of phi square root. And then we get the norm of x star x square root. But that's the same as the norm of x. Uh, so what have we shown? Uh, we've shown that, therefore, the norm of phi uh, square root has to be less than or equal to phi by one square root. 
because this holds for all x. Uh, okay, so that then gives the second condition here. And then also remember from what I mentioned last time, a good thing to keep in mind for this sort of motivation is what, what's happening on an abelian C-star algebra, which is just continuous functions on some locally compact Hausdorff space, in which case positive linear functionals just correspond to positive measures on the space, right, by the Reese representation theorem. Okay. Uh, here's another general fact to know is that not only, so let's write this as another lemma, and that is that if A has a unit uh, and if we have any bounded linear functional, so then phi is positive, if and only if phi of 1 is equal to its norm. Oh, we should, uh, I should also maybe remark here that, of course, phi of 1 is always less than or equal to the norm, of course. Right? So this shows, therefore, that they're equal. Uh, so let's prove this lemma. So one direction we proved, and that's right up here, that if you have a positive linear functional, then phi of 1 is equal to its norm. Uh, so now we want to prove the converse. If you have a uh, continuous linear functional and, and phi at the unit is equal to its norm, then it should be a positive linear functional. Uh, so that'll take a little bit more work, but it's still not so uh, bad. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove this. So let's suppose... P of 1 is equal to the norm of phi. And let's take x in the positive cone of A. And let's uh, write phi of x to be alpha plus i beta, where alpha and beta are real numbers. So our goal then is to show that beta is zero and alpha is non-negative. And then we'll do a very similar trick to how we showed that the spectrum of a positive operator is in the, in the non-negative reals. Uh, we'll just write um, uh, we'll just apply phi to um, x plus i t. And then the thing to notice, so we'll look at V applied to x plus i t, where t is going to be some real number. And then we'll look at the square of this absolute value. So here we take t a real number. And then on one hand, we can compute this. Uh, this will just be, um, what, alpha squared plus beta times t squared. So this is alpha squared plus beta uh, times uh, beta plus. So that comes from phi of x. And then we have beta plus t. And then we have phi at the identity squared. But on the other hand, this is less than or equal to the norm of x plus i t squared times the norm of phi squared. And now x is a positive element, so therefore the norm of x plus i t is dominated, the square of this is less than or equal to the norm of x squared plus uh, t squared. by computing its spectral radius. Since we know that the norm is, um, x is positive, it's self-adjoint, so the norm is equal to the spectral radius. Um, okay, so now we have this for all t, but then the other thing to notice is that phi of one is equal to the norm of phi, by hypothesis. 
so now we have some inequality here, and I claim that this inequality can't hold for all t uh, unless alpha has to be, or unless beta has to be equal to zero, right? Uh, because, of course, here you have a t squared, but here you're going to have t squared, which will cancel out with that, and then you're going to have a t times beta, and it's not going to hold for all t. Okay, so this inequality then implies that beta is equal to zero. So at least we know that it takes positive things to real numbers. And then to see that it takes positive things to positive numbers, you just notice that if you look at the norm of x times the norm of phi minus phi of x, then this is equal to phi of the norm of x minus x. And uh, this is certainly less than or equal to the norm of the norm of x minus x times the norm of phi. But now x is a positive element, and so again, by computing the spectral radius, you see that the norm of the norm of x minus x is dominated by the norm of x itself. So this is less than or equal to the norm of x times the norm of phi. Uh, so then we get some cancellation, and uh, what do we see? We see that negative phi of x is less than or equal to zero, so phi of x is positive. Okay, so note this is a real number here, so we can, we already showed it, showed it was a real number. Okay, any questions about that? All right, that's a little bit of a trick. Uh, one thing you can use this for, let's do the following proposition. That if uh, phi in the dual is positive, so then, there exists a unique extension uh, to the unitization uh, such that, uh, let's give it a name, let's call it V tilde, such that it preserves the norm. So if A is, does not have a unit and we have a positive linear functional, then there's only one way to extend it to the, to the unitization preserving the norm. So let's go ahead and prove this. And we kind of can guess how we would uh, extend it. We want to define phi tilde on the unit to just be the norm of phi. So that's what we want to do. Uh, so I should say this is unique positive, positive extension. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, prove this. Um, if, if you state, uh, if you say that phi is positive, then uh, you can say that this is a uh, no, of course, by definition, positive takes positive things to non-negative numbers. No, no, I'm saying, uh, why, do you, why did you specify that it uh, has to be a positive extension? Uh, because, of course, uh, let's see. Um, uh, you could probably define it just to be a million at one, and that'll give you some extension, but it won't be positive. I mean, probably it won't have the same norm here. Yeah. Yeah. You could define it to be zero, define it to be zero or one or something, and it's not positive. Right? Okay. All right. So let's give a proof of this. Um, so we'll let uh, al uh, alpha to use alpha a a lambda 
to be an increasing approximate identity in A that we showed exists. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So what do we know? We know these are all bounded by one, so we know that phi a lambda, uh, even the square of this, is bounded and increasing, and hence converges to something. Uh, so therefore, we, oh, we don't know it's increasing because we take the squares, but we certainly know it's bounded uh, and hence has a limit point, and hence passing to a subsequence, uh, we, or a subnet, I should say, we know that this converges to some beta. We can find that this converges. Uh, now, if so, if we have X is an A, uh, yeah, let's say norm of X. Less than or equal to one. Let's compute the absolute value of phi of x. Uh, so on one hand, we know that we have an approximate identity. So we can write this as the limit as lambda goes to infinity of phi of a lambda x. Now we can use Cauchy-Schwarz. Say this is less than or equal to, say, the lim soup as lambda goes to infinity of phi of a lambda squared square root and phi of x star x square root. That's why I wanted the a lambda squared there. Um, so we know that this converges then to beta, or I guess square root of beta. And, uh, and here we can just use the norm on this, so this is less than or equal to um, beta square root norm of x and the norm of x. So it's the same uh, inequality we did down here, right? Where here we don't have a unit, but we have an approximate unit, and we can do the same thing. So what does this mean? This means that therefore beta is less than or equal to the norm of phi. Uh, but of course, we also have the reverse inequality, just like we have down here, less than or equal to beta. So beta is equal to the norm. In particular, this shows that this net actually converges because any subnet, any, uh, any convergent subnet converges to the same thing. So we get, therefore, that this net automatically converges to beta. Well, how does this help us? Now we can just define the extension <coughs> we define phi tilde of x direct sum a to be equal to phi of x plus a times beta, which is the norm of this. But now how do we show that this is a positive linear functional? And that's where we use uh, the effect up there um, because we can say that uh, What do we know? We know that phi tilde of x plus a is now the limit as lambda tends to infinity of 
Phi of A lambda X A lambda. That's because A is an approximate uh, unit. Uh, and plus, oh, maybe I should use a different thing by A. I'm already using A. Let's use alpha. Plus alpha times A lambda squared. Because by definition, phi of A lambda squared tended to beta. So we have this. Uh, but on the other hand, we can just compute. So this is the limit as lambda tends to infinity of phi of, uh, oh, so I don't want to say that. So this is true for all x. So therefore, let's compute phi tilde of x plus alpha star x plus alpha. Well, this is phi tilde. We just do the computation. So this is x star x plus uh, alpha x star plus alpha bar x. Some squared. Which by this computation is then the limit as lambda tends to infinity of phi of a lambda x star x plus alpha x star plus alpha bar x plus, uh, well, a lambda, and then plus absolute value alpha squared a lambda squared. But this now we can write as the limit as lambda tends to infinity of a square, not just an A tilde, but an A. This is already an A. This is V of uh, X A lambda plus A lambda star. Uh, there should be an alpha here somewhere. Alpha A lambda uh, times X A lambda plus alpha A lambda. Yep, that looks good. Okay, but now we see that this is all in the C star algebra A, not an A tilde. And so we have that it's a positive linear functional there, so this is greater than or equal to zero. All right, so therefore it's a positive linear functional. So this proves that there exists uh, an extension, and we also have that the norm of phi tilde is just phi tilde at one, which is beta, which is the norm of phi. On the other hand, we know that uh, any extension has to satisfy this string of equalities. So that proves the unique, the uniqueness. So this means that when dealing with positive linear functionals, we can almost always consider the case where A is unital by passing to the unitization and then taking the unique extension there. All right. So now we can actually get to some very nice uses of uh, positive linear functional. So here's one thing. So let me first of all recall that phi and A is a state if it is positive. and has norm one. So these are analogs of probability measures from topology. Um, okay, so these are the non-commutative probability measures. Um, and it's a nice space, it's compact in the weak star topology. We mentioned that last time. So we'll let S of A denote the state space. All right, so here's a proposition. Uh, 
that uh, if we have an element x in the C star algebra, and you have some number in the spectrum of x, so then there exists a state uh, phi such that phi of x is equal to lambda. Uh, so maybe let's think about what this means for the abelian case. There A is uh, continuous functions on some locally compact Hausdorff space. We have some element there, some function. Uh, so we have some lambda in the spectrum, so that's just the range of this function. So if we have a point in the range of a function, then I claim that there is a probability measure such that integrating with that, that function with that probability measure gives that point. And indeed there is, this a triviality, just take the Dirac mass at that point. So this is a really trivial proposition uh, in this. Uh, of course there you get not only a state, but a homomorphism. Of course in the non-commutative case, maybe there won't be so many homomorphisms to the complex numbers. Uh, so we have to work with states instead. So this is the idea. All right, and let's go ahead and prove this. So this has a very nice proof. No, a completely different proof than what I just told you, of course. Because what I just told you means that in particular you had homomorphisms into the complex numbers. So in a non-commutative setting, think of B of H. Uh, B of H uh, has no homomorphisms into the complex numbers. Right? So it's very, very different. Um, so we have to be a bit more clever, but here's the very nice cute proof. Uh, so what we can do is let's first of all assume that uh, X is not the uh, not a scalar because then this is true for all states. Uh, so uh, in that case, we'll define phi naught mapping the span of X plus. Oh, I should uh, mention, of course. So this is true in the non-unital case, but by the proposition we just did. Uh, we can always extend states to the unit, so it's enough just to assume that A is unital. So we can assume, we assume A has a unit. By considering the unitization and then extending any state uniquely there. Uh, so we define this map phi naught from the span of X uh, and the span of the units uh, into the complex numbers by phi naught uh, of, let's say, alpha x plus beta is just going to be alpha lambda plus beta. Hmm? Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. All right, so if there exists such a state, we know that at least on this two-dimensional subspace it should satisfy this. And indeed, if we just define phi naught by this, then uh, it's quite easy to see that the, uh, say, absolute value of phi naught uh, applied to alpha x plus uh, beta, well, this is equal to absolute value of alpha lambda plus beta, and this is less than or equal to the norm of alpha x plus beta, because we know that alpha lambda plus beta is in the spectrum of this operator. So therefore, this is less than or equal to the spectral radius. Right, so we have this. But that means that phi naught uh, has norm 1. So therefore, we get that phi naught is less than or equal to 1, but we also know that that's equal to phi naught at 1, so it has norm 1. Well, now we can use Han Banach and say that it extends to some linear functional. Uh, so by Han Banach, phi naught extends to some phi, which is a continuous linear functional on uh, A, but we also know that such that the norm of phi is less than or equal to the norm of phi naught 
but this we already know is equal to 1, and this we already know is uh, um, less than or equal to uh, phi of 1. Well, it's equal to phi of 1. So here phi is a continuous linear functional such that uh, phi at 1 is equal to its norm. And so therefore we get that it's positive. So that's a very nice, clever proof. So why is this so useful? Well, this means that we can tell properties of x just by looking at uh, what happens when we apply states to them. So in particular, we have this nice proposition. So a, a C star algebra, x and a. So the following hold. So one is that x is equal to zero if and only if phi of x is equal to zero for all phi in the state space. So the state space uh, separates points. It can determine if you're zero or not. Uh, two, x is self-adjoint if and only if uh, phi of x is real for all states. Three, uh, x is positive if and only if phi of x is non-negative for all states. So let's prove this. Uh, maybe the only non-trivial thing is the first part. So we can uh, write x as x1 plus i x2, where x, i are self-adjoint. Take the usual decomposition there. Uh, so let's, so of course if x is zero, then that's true. So let's suppose uh, if we have the phi of x is equal to zero for all states phi. Well, we know that states take uh, self-adjoint things to real numbers. So therefore, we know that the real and imaginary part of phi of x has to also be zero. So that therefore implies that phi of x1 is equal to zero, is equal to phi of x2, and this is for all phi states A. But by the previous proposition, we know that anything in the spectrum of x1, there's some state which gets it. So that means that uh, the spectrum of x1 has to be just the zero point singleton, and same with x2, but these now are self-adjoint elements, and so therefore that means they're zero. So this implies that x1 is equal to x2 is equal to zero. So that's how you prove uh, one. Uh, two is, uh, is similar. Uh, you just look at I mean, we just bootstrap it from one. So for two, so if phi of x is real for all phi in the state space, so then we can look at what is uh, phi of x minus x star. Now phi is positive, so it preserves uh, it's in particular Hermitian. We proved that last time. So this is phi of x minus phi of x bar, which is zero. And this is for all state space, so therefore by part one, we have that this element is zero. And then for the last part, uh, we can do... Um, Yeah, for the last part, it's similar. So for three, uh, if phi of x is non-negative for all states, well, then by part two, we already know that x is equal to x star because it's in particular real. 
but now we have, a, uh, by the previous proposition, we know that the spectrum is also contained in the non-negative real, since it's now self-adjoint. Uh, and the spectrum of x is contained in the non-negative reals. And like I said, since it's self-adjoint, this implies it's positive. It implies that x greater than a equals 0, since it's self-adjoint. All right. So you can really tell quite a lot from just the plain states. So there are lots of states, in other words, enough to separate points. Well, uh, normality, what's that? Oh, when x is normal? Uh, I mean, you could look at x star x minus, I mean, if you can tell when something is zero, so you could certainly look at x star x minus x x star. Right, so you're normal if and only if phi of x star x is equal to phi of x x star uh, for all phi. Okay, that's not really saying much, but uh, okay. But I like this theorem. Okay, that's good. Um, all right. So why is it uh, useful that we have so many states? Uh, and that's because states can be associated to representation. So this is the GNS construction. So this stands for Galfon, Mimark, and Siegel, uh, who first introduced this. Uh, so this is a very, very powerful uh, tool which you see over and over and over again in many different forms. So this is just the first form we're seeing it here. Uh, so what is what is the GNS construction? So we start with uh, a a C star algebra and phi uh, a state. Well, there's one uh, one situation where you get a state. Mainly, you could take a representation into B of H, and then you could take a vector state in B of H. And the GNS construction says that this is the only way you can get a state. All right, so the, the theorem is, uh, is that there, then there exists a star homomorphism. Well, there exists a Hilbert space H, a unit vector, say C naught, an H, and a star homomorphism pi from A to B of H, such that P of x is just the vector state corresponding to this representation in this vector. Uh, moreover, there's a uniqueness. Uh, moreover, we can assume that pi of a times c see not that the span of this is dense in H and this is unique, the unique representation which satisfies us up to unitary natural equivalences. And this is then unique up to a conjugation. <coughs> So what I mean by that is that if there's another Hilbert space K and uh, you have another unit vector there, say eta, and you have another star homomorphism which satisfies this, uh, then there's going to be a unitary from K to H. That unitary is going to take eta to uh, C naught. The unitary is also going to interconjugate the two representations. Uh, and so that's really the same. I don't want to write out what I mean in detail. 
All right, so I'll just show you how to construct it. Once you've constructed it, the uniqueness is fairly straightforward, and I'll leave to you guys to think about. All right, so what is the construction? Uh, well, we know that we have from states, we get positive linear functionals. The cauchy schwarz inequality came from that. Uh, and this is always a good sign whenever you have this because this means that there's a Hilbert space floating around in there. And so this is what we'll do. Uh, let me also, uh, to make my life easier, uh, well, we can't do this, but let's just assume A is unital. So assume A has a unit. Uh, otherwise, just consider phi extended to the, the unitization and then work there. And then, of course, you can restrict back down to A once you have this representation. Uh, okay, so we assume A has a unit. Uh, so then what can we do? Well, we can define... Well, like I said, we define this inner product. Uh, phi xy to be equal to phi of y star x. And this is a non-negative definite inner product. Uh, I should say, yeah, non-negative definite inner product. Uh, it may have a kernel, so let's let n be the set of x and a such that phi of x star x is equal to zero. Uh, we know that this is equal is equal to the same as x and a, such that phi of x star y is equal to zero for all y and a by cauchy schwartz right? Uh, and why do I write it like this? Because from this, it's obvious to see that it's a subspace. So this is a subspace, uh, and now we can define define now the inner product on, uh, define h to be the completion of a mod n with respect to this inner product. So the point is, is that by quotienting out by n, now we have a genuine positive definite inner product. All right, so the elements of h, uh, you'll, you'll have equivalence classes of elements in a, and then you'll have the completion of this. So this is a Hilbert space. And now, uh, so we found a Hilbert space. Now we need to find a representation. Well, there's a natural. Since A is sitting aside here, we just extend multiplication. So we define I mapping A to bounded operators on H by pi of A times X. So I'll use brackets to denote the equivalence class uh, is equal to AX. So I should verify that this is well defined. Uh, that is that um, if this represents zero, then this should also represent zero, right? Or if you have two equivalence classes representing the same thing. Uh, so notice that uh, if uh, X is an N, so then phi of um, x a star a x is, remember, a star a in norm is less than or equal, or a star a is always less than or equal to the norm of a squared, and conjugation preserves this, so this is less than or equal to the norm of a squared phi of x star x, which is equal to zero. All right, we just showed that n is, in fact, a left ideal. Um, but that means that this is well-defined. So therefore, pi is well-defined. Uh, let's verify that it's actually bounded. Uh, that should just be the same uh, inequality right here. Right? This is the norm of Ax squared, and this is the norm of 
x squared. So this shows that it's well-defined, but it also shows that it gives you a bounded operator. Uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, representation is obvious, just because left multiplication is associative. Uh, we should check that it preserves, it's a star homomorphism, so for that let's look at what is pi a star x, take the inner product with y, and then we just compute this, and this is ax inner product with y, which is phi of y star ax, which is the inner product of x and now a star y which is in the adjoint right. uh, oh a star thank you and that has no a which we can now write this as pi of a star x And it's enough to verify, oh, of course, uh, this only really doesn't define it in B of H, this defines it on a dense subspace. But because we showed that it's bounded right here, then it extends to the completion. And same with this, since this is true on a dense subspace, it's therefore true on the completion. So this gives a star representation. Uh, and now the only thing we need to do is find out what is uh, C naught and verify that it gives the vector state gives us our state back. Well, this is why I wanted to take a unital. So nowhere did we use that it's unital yet, but now I'm just going to define C naught to be the class containing this unit. And now let's compute uh, phi of, uh, well, let's compute the other way. So let's just compute pi of a c naught c naught. Oh, I should notice that the norm of this squared is phi of one, which is one. Uh, so it's a unit vector, and then this inner product right here is just going to be exactly inner product of a one, which is phi of a. So it does give us our uh, state that we start with. So every st the GNS construction shows that every state comes from a uh, representation. So since we know there are lots of states by this previous proposition, this now means that there are lots of representations. And this will be something we'll exploit next time.